Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Mastering Dungeons. I'm Sean Merwin, here with the not at all frazzled Teos Abadia. Hey, Teos. Hey, Sean. How's it going? Uh, yeah, my daughter's in town and uh, it's been great, but also means that like yesterday I was up learning about the UN until uh, like midnight and then I was like, oh yeah, I've got a video to put out. I guess I'll be up late today. I'm a little, a little sleepy. It's good when your daughter can come teach you the finer points of of speaking to the United Nations. <laughs> uh, you know, mm -hmm. th those those small things. <laughs> like one does. Yeah, she's she's kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. Definitely a, yeah. uh, a, a what do you call it? A, a case study. And uh, if you do a lot of effort, it can pay off. She's, we're lucky that way. Yeah. Well, for for me, it was not a lot of effort, but still paying off. I got to talk to a. Uh, a class. Oh yeah. Mr. C's RPG. He's a listener and I'm not going to give his name. I'll call him Mr. C. Mr. C's uh, RPG workshop students. I talked to them last week and it was really fun. We talked about role playing games in general. We talked about world building and they were a great bunch of kids who, uh, hmm. who came up with some brilliant and insightful thoughts on both role playing games and cool world building concepts. So uh, hmm. thank you. Uh, to Mr. C for the opportunity to to talk to your students. It was it was very fun. But there are also people listening to us. And sometimes these people have questions or comments. We're going to go through two of those today. First is from Jason Campbell via our Patreon. Uh, Jason says, I want to see what your take was on one aspect of the Cobalt Press's uh, playtest packet number four for Tales of the Valiant. Um, this was a monster playtest packet uh, in terms of not monster in terms of topic. large. That was we got that from Wizards of the Ghost. <laughs> uh, this was the monsters were the topic. Yes. Uh, so Jason continues in the description of resistance and vulnerability. They say that resistance means you take 50 percent of the damage on a fail and vulnerability means you take double damage. OK. But it also says resistance gives you advantage on your saving throw roll and vulnerability gives you disadvantage. That seems like a major change. I haven't played it out yet, but doesn't that seem like double dipping? And so, Jason, this is a gr great question because I started really like thinking about this and even doing math about what sort of what sort of swing does that make if you both have. You know, if you have vulnerability and disadvantage on the save, what percentage chance does the does the you know doesn't give you to increase? And then I read the packet again very closely, and I did uh, read it before, but I didn't notice this, so I read it again. And what they're talking about is you have advantage or disadvantage on your saving throw if you have resistance or vulnerability to a condition, not to the damage. So, for example. There's a monster uh, called the uh, Crimson Jelly, which is an ooze. It is resistant to the grappled condition. So if it, if it was uh, resistant to cold, then it would just be the 50% reduction to damage, not the uh, advantage on saving throws. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's... Uh, that's what that part means. It's only if it's vulnerable or resistant to the condition does it get that uh, advantage or disadvantage on saving throws. But that in itself is odd because I was thinking, okay, so you are resistant to grappling, which would mean in this play test you have advantage against being grappled on saving throws, but grappling, at least in the five, normal 5e rules, it's not a saving throw against being grappled. It's a it's an ability check that you oppose generally with your athletics or acrobatics. So unless the the valiant playtest rules say that grappling is now a saving throw rather than uh, rather than an ability check and a opposed, opposed ability check normally, then that doesn't make a lot of sense. But maybe in a previous playtest packet, they talked about that, and I just didn't see it. Yeah, and it'd be, you know, would it just be for like the escape DC or something like that? That's the kind of stuff you have to iron out over time. And a lot right. of that I'm not worried about because I know like they will figure this out. You know, they'll clean this up down the road. But 
it's that kind of thing that uh, these sort of variant D and D rules that do use D and D as their core impose these special situations that then as a dm you've got to have this split brain you know like oh mm-hmm. well i'm using a level up 5e monster so i've got to keep this in mind and, oh, and i'm using the cold right. press monster so i gotta keep this in mind and now i'm <laughs> and that that yep. gets that you know takes up a lot of brain space and and, and isn't for everyone and that's that's yeah that's tough because these companies want it to be widely adopted and that's that give and take mm-hmm. My brain already has partitions for first edition, second edition, third edition, fourth edition. Now there's a fifth edition partition, and now I have to make the different partitions for the different playtests coming out. Uh, there's not a lot of space up there. And left then your, your kids are going to run defrag when you're not looking, and then mm, it's all gone. Yeah. So thank you for that question, J- Jason. I hope I hope what I said was right, and I hope that helps. Uh, and the other question comment we had was from uh, the Mathemagician via the Dungeon uh, Mastering Dungeons Discord channel. I wonder what are the design considerations for applying stat blocks uh, for the polymorph spell? Local context. We had a session get gummed up this weekend because a PC wanted to get to a platform 100 feet in the air from which the enemy was lobbing fireballs. She wanted to polymorph herself into something that could A, fly, and B, have sufficient combat stats to harass a high-level enemy. This took considerable digging, even with D&D Beyond. Sure would have been nice to have a quick, I need these kind of stats for this spell, while also having the option to use it uh, to neutralize an enemy, such as turning a land-based enemy into a helpless whale. And also, she had no idea what CR meant because that was using DM-facing language in a player-facing book, which seems problematic. And my answer to this is, yes, all of the above and more. Mm. Uh, It it does slow things down. And that's only, what, a fifth-level spell polymorph is? Is it fifth or sixth? I I lose track of these things because Mm -hmm. first edition, second edition, third edition. Uh, So... Yes, it, it would be nice to have a quick and simple solution. But if you give a quick and simple solution, then the people that don't want a quick and simple solution are upset that you've given them a solution that's too quick and too simple. And so the answer is to give multiple solutions, which then cause friction, cause people to be confused. Uh, because first edition, fourth edition, fifth edition, uh, and then one solution two solutions we're we're all over the place uh so but your point about the dm facing language in a player facing rule book is definitely well taken and that's something that should be ironed out say if they're going to revise an edition uh they could maybe take a look at that yeah and math magician brought this up in in the context of uh, the feedback around the druid play test right which used these sort of standard mm-hmm. stat blocks for form a uh, large part due to lots of players saying to wizards, gee, this is a pain to have to look all these things up and look, I end up optimizing into being the same creature anyway. And and but then other people will say, I love choosing forms, right? And 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 I think that polymorph is enough of one spell that in general I would say, hey, if you're a player choosing polymorph, this is what you're signing up for. Yeah. And we're all signing up for the fact that you're probably going to open up a monster book and flip through and um you know, and I have, might have ways I'd adjudicate the specific version. Like if really you're trying to fly and you have this, I might just put two stat blocks together and, and say, you know, this is what you are. Um, but but it, it's it's a specific spell, so I don't have a huge problem with it at the game level. And in that a spell that says look through all the monsters and choose what you want, fine. You know, and, and, and you can have a table roll. Like you've got 10 minutes and tell me what you turn into. Um, but when it's a larger system, right, when it's a core thing your class does or, or, or something like that, that's where I think it's a little rough to, you know, you don't want the player of a druid saying, I'm going to shape change into something. Give me all the monsters that have the beast in it, all the books that have a beast in it, because uh, that's endless, right? And, and endless confusion. And yeah, and things like CR and stuff. It's difficult. Mm-hmm. And this is this is the hard part where we can all have our own separate beliefs about what's best. And based on who we are, who we game with, 
if we have our home group that we're comfortable with, if we're game mastering for several different groups of new players, expert players, and what needs to happen is Wizards of the Coast needs to decide what they want. Make the game. what they want, yeah. what they want for the game, make that the baseline, and then say in in a in the DM's guide or in a sidebar, if you want a more complex game, allow this to happen. Mm-hmm. Or if you make it complex, say, if you want a simpler game, we suggest doing this. Uh, because this this tool, this machine that we have in front of us right now is very complex. Yeah. And some people love it complex and some people want it to be simpler. And the Wizards of the Coast, this is where the marketing people come in. Right. This is where you do those surveys, not just to <laughs> not just to expert players to get their opinions, but go to people who don't even play yeah. D&D and say, if you were going to play D&D, how complex would you want the game to be? Mm-hmm. And figure out based on metrics and based on potential income from those different groups and all of those things take into consideration what choice you make for the type of game you want. You know, I'd almost pay money. Uh, I have a limited budget. That's why I say almost. But to see, to <laughs> sit down some, some, you know, Wizards employees and have them watch a brand new set of players as they use um, some of the pregens that have been giving out at Adventures, right? Um, like, in fact, what was the, pa- there was a packet recently that had some, some pregens in it. Um, I think it was for the school program, maybe. And they don't reprint all of the spells they just give you a couple and so i'd love to have like you know staff watches this game careens to a halt as the wizard goes hey i have all these spells i don't know what they do mm-hmm. and then the cleric goes yeah i have a bunch of spells i only know what one of them does uh uh, uh you know and, and meanwhile the fighter's just right. going off and whacking stuff without any problem whatsoever right and if it was running at third level the, the druid would say can you show me what what i do here when i wild shape you know what, what are my options and and how a new DM would handle all of that, right? Like, exactly, <laughs> right. And, and and like you say, not only that, but have this be a brand new DM who has just picked up the rules for the first time yeah. and try to parse all of that. Yeah, and, and it's not 1973, right? We have all of the tools to solve this. We we know how to fix all these problems if we can just kind of take the right steps, right? And and if we want to solve these problems, right? Maybe that's not the problem, right? Maybe. You just want your super invested players, right? I get a little worried with the play task mm-hmm. packets when the feedback says things like, you know, oh, my off turn damage as a rogue has gone down because that means these are folks who are super smart, and super well yep. aware of how D&D rules, as we've said in the past, uh, and not the casual player who couldn't care less whether they get an off turn sneak attack, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So... Great question, mathematician, and uh, you got the extended answer, but I hope uh, <laughs> that makes it clear where we stand, which is we have no idea where we stand. But to get to our big news and commentary section, we will start with the new Unearthed Arcana. Last week, we gave sort of the high-level view of what we thought of it, and I just want to maybe take one piece per week Mm-hmm. And just take a quick glance or, or a, a more in-depth glance into a smaller section. And one section that popped to mind was this new uh, weapon mastery properties part. So what is this? Well, first, let's first talk about a couple changes to regular weapon properties. So light weapons, they switched in the last packet to make them more like you. everyone gets two weapon fighting. Now they're switched back, so it's just uh, to allow a bonus action to make a quote-unquote offhand attack, as long as you have a light weapon in both hands, and you get no bonus, uh, no ability modifier added to that second attack. So you still get the roll the damage die, but you don't get that uh, if you use your bonus action to do it. And if you make a first attack with a light weapon in your original hand, yeah. Uh, and the throne property now allows you to draw a weapon to throw as part of that attack. It doesn't say, so it says weapons with the throne property. I'm trying to remember weapons mm-hmm. with the throne property uh, can be drawn as, as a free action, as no action. Uh, 
Now, it doesn't say if you throw it. It just says that they, they can be drawn. So I don't know if that means you must throw it in order to make that draw free, or if you any weapon with the thrown property can be drawn. If we're going to parse language, let's parse language. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so that's something that's now there in the throne uh, property for weapons. So if you're the dagger throwing type, you can now draw and throw as many as you have uh, actions in order to make that attack. Yeah. And then presumably use your free typical thing to then draw so that you have a dagger in your hand at the end of the round for any opportunity mm -hmm. attacks and so on. Yep. yep. So those were the smaller changes just to those two properties. Now let's dive into the weapon mastery properties. Whew. Every weapon will have a weapon mastery property. And if you have some sort of class or feat or some other element of your character that allows weapon mastery, you can then unlock that mastery property for the weapon that you are using. Hmm. What do you think of this in general? What do you think of this system? Um, so... First thought is that when this was introduced at the D&D &D Summit, people were basically drooling. And which is really funny because this is a group that had just been really angry at Wizards. And Jeremy Crawford starts explaining this and everybody's just like, whoa, candy, give me. <laughs> so I couldn't help but watch everybody around me. Well, is this the same crowd? Um, so so it, it's candy, right? It, it is fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that it's very cool in that it can go towards some classes. And I'm really looking at just the fighter here, though it's wider than the fighter. But specifically where the fighter to liven up the fighter that can be a little static, though. And I've heard you mm -hmm. say this before, like that's sort of the point of the fighter is to be boring, easy, simple. Now you're adding complexity to it, you know, so. But I think it's a nice way to sort of dress up melee classes a bit. I would argue that they're not needed for something like a monk. Like my monk always has like 15 things to do in a round. I don't know that I need to, you know, also do it. But in theory, this system should be reliable enough that you could, you know, pretty easily in most cases, uh, just throw that property onto what you're doing. And it just does that, you know, as part of your description and so on of what your character does. So it's probably OK. But I have a number of caveats where I'd really like to see this in play at a table where, you know, two characters have these things like a monk and a fighter. And how does that play out? Um, it reminds me of second edition, right, where you, there was a point in second edition around the kits era where you had all these uh, special things you could unlock about a specific monster. And they could be quite formidable. One weapon would be wildly different than the other and some would be way better. And so it just totally changed the balance of power around what items to choose, which was really interesting. That's a lot. Yeah. What do you think? I am very much in your camp on all of it. I think it's cool. Um, we did something at Ghostfire in our uh, player's guide with weapons. We gave certain weapons these traits where you could do special things with them. So it's not completely unique. It's been done before in different iterations of the game. And it's it goes along that same complexity line we were talking about with our last comment, right? Yes, it makes the game more complex. It makes a class that is generally one that's simpler to play more complex. Mm -hmm. And there's no there's no balance to if you choose not to use these things because you want to keep it simple. There's no, well, I, I get this instead, right? It's like the, the champion fighter, the complexity is reduced, but you get these things that are easy and possibly even comparable in strength to offset what you don't choose. Here, there's none of that. Uh, you know, it's like you could get the simple add to to every damage roll you make with a weapon. Uh to offset all these other things that you could do, yeah. but they don't do that, uh, which I, you know, it's fine. And I, I just worry every time new things are added to the system and I'm going to use the S word system because is this system or is this content? 
Uh, Are you saying all these things just to make me laugh? I mean, come on. (laughs) Yes, yes. Well, I mean, it it is part of the system, but it is only unlocked with the content that comes to us from a class, apparently. So, or two bottles of wine and an evening with Jeremy Crawford where we talk about content versus system. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's it's an interesting concept, and I, I I'm not trying to pick on anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's just it's been on my mind for forever. <laughs> Let's but, safely call know, this system this weapons thing because you know, like here, yeah. here's a random thought to just interject. But the, the kind of thing that that matters, right? Is like in D and D, there's in most editions this huge love affair with swords, and we get it right mm-hmm. thematically. But the yeah. long sword is so much better in so many ways. The great sword is so much better in so many ways. And all you've got to do is look at the magic items to know it. Because there are all these magic items that literally only come in long sword and great sword and or sword, you know, and and those are the ones you want damage wise and whatever. And so like everybody just uses that. Not everybody, but most players will use those things and the magic system rewards you. And now maybe we have a reason why you want something else, but then you're going to get a flaming long sword and... You know, I have no problem as a DM changing that, but but a lot of people do. And and so, you know, I'd like to once again call for D&D to stop assigning magic items to a specific weapon type. Right. And, and embrace mm-hmm. all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that's an example true. of the extension of that system. Right. Like rules like this right. beg for monster or uh, magic items that are flexible in this way. Right. And not just the flex property, uh, <laughs> right. but yeah. so w- we talked before about you know Wizards of the Coast needing needing to decide what they want to do with the game, and this tells us that they want a more complex game. Mm-hmm. They want people to be have to make these hard these choices. Not only what weapon to use, but what property to use along with the weapon. And then when to use that special property, if at all, and what's the best property to use, what will do the most good for their party. I'm fine with all that. If that's what you want your game to be. Now, that's not the choice I would make, but if that's the choice you want to make, this is a this is a definitely a good way to do it. But now you have to take those steps down the road to look at each one of these things and say, have we worded this in a way that cannot be absolutely broken when put with something else that we might not be expecting people to make the connection with? And, and the kind of thing that, to, just to drive this home, like level one fighter, right, in this playtest packet, you get your fighting style. That's mm-hmm. already a big sort of like, whoa, where am I going? But, but you know, it's, it makes a little sense, but okay, I'm going to choose my fighting style. Then I'm going to get second win, so I've got to understand what those rules are. And if you run new player tables, they love using it, but forget it. <laughs> you have to remind mm-hmm. them of this. And then weapon mastery, choose three kinds of simpler martial weapons that yeah. give you this. And every long rest, you can change that up, right? Mm-hmm. And that is that kind of thing. It's, it's like the druid looking up forms or this polymorph spell. Like Now you've got to go off and read through the entire weapon table and decide which three you're getting. But oh, by the way, you don't have the money to buy all these weapons. So you're really choosing three, but taking one. And and it's just, you know, it's just like so much work. And at the end of all this work that a new player has to do, are we better off? Are we having more fun? Maybe, probably a bit. But is it worth that level of work? And, you know, so then maybe the game's not for new players, to which I go, have we thought about the business case? <laughs> yep. Because yeah. the making money, the reaching a billion dollar brand, you know, ridiculousness is predicated on an enormous audience. There's no other way around it, right? A, core, a huge audience has to be a part of this. So you've got to have lots of new players that should be front of center on the list of things you're trying to achieve um, versus what I might want, right? I think this is, this is great. Like for me, love it. Can't wait to play a fighter with weapon mastery. But I'm not your mm-hmm. typical player by any stretch yeah. of the imagination, right? Yeah, including negative things. Yes, I have to take a slight diversion here. Please. Yesterday, I played again with my first edition friends, mm-hmm. uh, and we leveled. So we had two players who got to pick a fighting style. 
and I'm playing the cleric. So I'm not, and I'm trying not to tell them what to do or how to, I'm going to let the DM handle that. I'm not the DM. So they got to choose fighting styles. And of all the fighting styles, we have a paladin and a ranger. Both pick choosing fighting styles. Of all the fighting styles that there is to choose from, they both took the same one, blind fighting. I don't think I've ever seen a situation where that would necessarily come in handy on a regular basis, right? Archery, absolutely, sure. right? The paladin, the you know, the defensive one, oh yeah. Uh, all you know, all of these, they both took mm. blind fighting, That's cool. and I'm trying to. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm hoping that at some point in our adventuring career, they get a chance to use that, <laughs> but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, Grimlock uh, encounter around the corner. Can't wait. Right, exactly, and you know they're not expert with this no. th- these rules. So what? How would they know? That just seems like it's a good idea, right? Yeah, we're going to be in the dark at some point. And that's the kind of thing, the game used to be full of that, right? Like um, third edition with rangers picking uh, your your favorite enemy, right? And like, But I was playing in the living Greyhawk Jeff campaign where we're fighting giants. So my bonus of fighting giants came up constantly and it was awesome, mm-hmm. right? But the game doesn't intend for that. But here I am right. <laughs> benefiting. And that's the kind of thing like yep. blind sight might never come up or it might be the biggest thing ever because here we are in this underdark campaign and nobody has dark vision for whatever reason. But most mm-hmm. gaming groups would have very little reason to use that one. And they both yep. chose it. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yep. yep. So funny story. Anyway, so let's talk about each of these mm-hmm. or at least the highlights yeah. of these uh, properties. First is cleave. You hit a creature with a melee attack. You can make an attack roll with the weapon against a second creature within five feet of the first that is also within your reach. On a hit, the the second creature takes the weapon's damage, but don't add your ability modifier to that damage unless the modifier is negative, and you can make this uh, extra attack only once per turn. Uh, So it's a second attack for free. You don't need to use your bonus action to do it. And, you know, it comes up in a, in a, a, not always, you're not always going to have two enemies right next to each other within your reach. It wasn't second attack does leave when you kill a creature, you could continue on. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so what I liked about that version is that it didn't eat up time every single turn. It was sort of this juicy mm-hmm. extra bit. And of course it comes up less often, but to me, that's sort of the point where you are not, um, like this is just I love the tactical of it right now. You want it almost begs for a grid or or at least a lot of description where you say, OK, I want to stand next to these two foes. But then it, yeah. Yeah, it might be all the time or very often that you're now making taking up more time on your turn. And maybe that's good. Maybe it's not. Yeah. And the second attack, while it doesn't add your ability damage modifier, but there's no other limiters on it. Mm-hmm. So you have uh, rage damage. You want to smite on that second attack? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. You kill the first person, you go on to the second person, maybe you move your hunter's mark and you can attack that second person. You got Mm -hmm. green flame blade going? Uh, Does that? Mm -hmm. that, The spell lasts one round. Uh, So if you attack the first, when you go into the second... Does that allow you to use Green Flame Blade again to damage the? Because the Green Flame Blade lets you do, do some damage to the on an attack, but I, I'd have to. I think there's a limit on that based on the wording of it. But I'd have to look it up, which is <laughs> speaks to your point. When I that. looked, when I looked, I yeah. didn't see. You know, it said like the attack, but is this attack the same? Right. It. I. This. The, the spell is. It lasts for one round. That was very specific. Uh, so right, these are the questions that then come up. Yeah, what can you do? What else happens when you do this? How else can it be used? And everything that you write from now on has to come back and ask, hmm, and this will, would this work with Cleveland? Would that be unbalancing in some way? Yeah. Uh, Flax 
Now, compared to the other one, Flex seems like practically nothing. When you hit with a melee attack using this weapon, you deal versatile damage, even if you're wielding it with one hand. So some weapons, it's a D8 in one hand and a D10 in two hands, right? So even though you're using it in one hand, you can do one, basically one extra point, maybe two extra points Mm -hmm. per attack. Is that worth all the rules that go into (laughs) figuring out to use that weapon and make that choice. <laughs> yeah, you can do it every time, but what's your player is, type? Is your player type optimizer or you know, instigator, actor? You know, yeah, I, I just I, I don't know. Mm. Uh, and and I, I'm not I'm not opposed to it. It just I'm wondering. Uh, Graze is the next one. If you if you're atta- uh, if you attack. If your attack roll with this weapon misses, you can deal damage to that creature equal to the ability modifier used to make the attack roll. This damage is the same type dealt by the weapon, and the damage can't be increased in any way other than increasing the ability modifier. All right, so what does the damage can't be increased in any way actually mean? Does it mean that the damage that that weapon does can't be increased. But if there's something going on where if a creature takes damage, they take more damage or, you know, something like that. Does that count? Right. Like because that's not part of the they're attack. Vulnerable with that. Like they're vulnerable bludgeoning and you do bludgeoning. Yeah. If it's the same type. Right. right? Is, yeah. is that, my the, guess is that is you that, can't, yeah. you know, what they what they are trying to say here is that extra piece of damage that's equal to your ability score, you cannot increase that probably based on anything, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just the ability modifier. It seems to be what they're saying. Uh, well, that's why they said the, other than increasing the ability modifier, but they will need to parse that very carefully to avoid, right? right. Endless discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Right. If if there's if there's a, a a spell, if there's an effect that says if this creature takes damage, it also blank blank blank. Yeah. So that has nothing to do with this attack. That has to do with the creature being damaged, which is separate from the attack. Mm-hmm. So it's it, it's a yeah. It needs to be clarified. Uh, any any thoughts? No, no, it's fine. You want to take the next one? Sure. Uh, Nick, when you make the extra attack, the light property, you can make it as part of the attack action instead of as a bonus action. You can still make this, this extra attack only once per turn. So this is your your the, the current state of where things are with uh, using a light weapon to get an extra attack off of it. And so they're letting you now do that through the Nick property that it can do it as part of the attack action does need up your bonus, which is only to use your bonus for whatever your class would normally do. So if I'm a monk fighter, I have a dagger in each hand. I can make a dagger attack with my main hand, then a second dagger attack as part of that Nick thing, and then my bonus action to make an unarmed attack with my feet, right, as, as, or headbutt or whatever, uh, that seems perfectly reasonable. Right. You just only get Nick once per turn. Okay. But you can still use that bonus action to make attacks. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so it's basically Nick just lets you do that. uh, It gives you an extra dagger attack, right? That that is part Mm -hmm. of your attack action. All right, cool. Instead of Uh, eating up the bonus, yeah. Yep. Push. If you hit a creature with this weapon, you can push the creature up to 10 feet away from you uh, if it was no more than one size larger than you. So I can see this being very, very useful in we're standing on a cliff, we're standing next to lava, we're standing next to uh, right a cloud of daggers spell. Yeah, and this is one of the things where I watch for because 4E had a lot of push and move mm-hmm. and and as a result, it had to be super, super careful 
uh, that it wasn't abused. And so you had all these kinds of rules for when you push someone into damaging terrain or off an edge or something. And that really doesn't exist in 5e. So if we start doing it all the time, or you know, if we start how it interacts with things like damaging zones and things like that, it's going to be a little interesting whether they create whether they paint themselves into a corner with something like this. And what they've been very careful to do so far with fifth edition is avoid small creatures having a lot of penalties in relation to medium-sized creatures. Mm -hmm. And what this does is it says, well. Medium creatures could push large creatures, but small creatures can't push large creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, so that adds that little bit of discrepancy between those sizes back. Also, a heavy crossbow has the push property. And so I'm trying to figure out why a small creature using a heavy crossbow with the push property would have any harder time pushing a creature mm -hmm. than a medium-sized creature and while it's super cinematic and we love it in movies uh weapons don't push people backwards like this projectile weapons guns whatever is like that's not a thing that physics supports uh xkcd's what if did a great series on this um so it's yeah. fun but <laughs> not logical yep uh sap if you hit a creature with this weapon, that creature has disadvantage on its next attack roll before the start of your next turn. Uh, you yeah, yeah. Mm. I mm. I I like DMs who are fans of the players, but I also understand that DMs like to roll dice and sometimes succeed. <laughs> sometimes, yeah, and. And having disadvantage, it's already hard enough to hit players a lot. Uh, and so to have disadvantage on your first attack roll, and if that's the only attack roll you get, that's tough. And if you have a hard enough time hitting already with all the things that characters can do, uh, it's just, it's a little, it can be a little non fun for certain types of, of DMs. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I don't uh, like nerfing monsters. I just yeah, prefer to not see unless it's really you know every now and then, right? The big thing, the big moment. You want to do that? Cool, but I don't love it as happening all the time. No. Uh, slow. If you hit a creature with this weapon and deal damage to the creature, you can reduce its speed by ten feet until the start of your next turn. If you hit the creature more than once with this property, the speed reduction doesn't exceed ten feet. Down with it. So Love you it. can't. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. Speed reduction uh, is topple. the thing that I think is totally fun tactics. It does, you know. Yep. It's, it's all fair. Yep. Topple. If you hit a creature with this weapon, you can force the creature to make a Constitution saving throw with a DC equal to eight plus your proficiency bonus plus the ability modifier used to make the attack roll. On a failed save, the creature has the prone condition. A few things. Well, at least there's a saving throw here. Uh, so that's something, but wow, that's a big deal mm -hmm. for everybody gets advantage for the rest of the round oh, yeah, all the until that works. creature acts again. And I can totally see the character who's going right after the bad, uh, you know, the bad guy saying, well, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to delay or not delay. I'm going to ready my action. So when uh, it acts, uh, I right after it acts, I hit it, and now it doesn't start until a full round of everybody beating on it. It's just too it's just too strong, and there's no size limitation. So you, you know, you're a small creature, and you hit that uh, colossal dragon. Yeah, that's a uh, that's something I'm going to have to waste my. Uh, what do you call it when you automatically succeed on a save? Yeah, your legendary. Yeah, your legendary uh, save. Uh, yeah, to to avoid that happening to you. So that's that's big. Yeah. Uh, yeah, last I, one is I, Vax. I, I, oh, I, I just the, just it's this point where I start going like, wait a minute, this stuff's going to be happening every round for mm -hmm. the rest of the campaign. And I go, oh, that's a bit, that's a bit much. I don't 
really want every attack that the Maul wielder does to topple my target all mm -hmm. campaign long. Oof. Yeah, just in terms of the rolling the saving throws. Oh, gosh, my, that's Carpal Tunnel right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the last one is Vex. If you hit a creature with this weapon and deal damage to the creature, you have advantage on your next attack roll against that creature before the end of your turn. Uh, before the end of your next turn. I mean, it's it's the same thing, right? It's, it's you at least hit, just one person. You, you, you have, yeah. <laughs> you have advantage on your next yeah. attack roll. So you know, Rogue is always going to have advantage. Uh, and on at least their first attack, it's just a yeah, it's it's a thing. Mm. The last thing in this section was they talked about the priest pack and the net as equipment, and this the net. I was just like, what? So net is now equipment, so it's not a weapon, so anyone can use it. Uh, when you take the attack action, you can replace one of your attacks. With the throw of a net at a creature within 15 feet of you. The target must succeed on a dexterity saving throw equal to 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your dex modifier. And as far as I could tell, everyone is proficient with the net. I didn't see anything say otherwise. Maybe I missed it. Was everybody not proficient? But then they wouldn't have mentioned this. Huh. Right, that, that's that's why I'm saying it. doesn't. Yeah. I don't think it says. So in, if you are hit by this net... You are restrained. Now, did they change the restraint condition or still does it still mean you are grappled, you are at disadvantage to hit, and right. you are at advantage to be hit? So again, the monster acts, the next person throws the net on them. Mm -hmm. They might make that dexterity saving throw, but if you're if everyone's proficient yeah. with it, uh you don't even have to roll an attack roll. It is just they have to try to dodge out of the way. So at first level, uh, assuming that you have any sort of dex modifier, say you have a plus two, you're looking at a DC 12. Most monsters, that's a 50-50 shot at best of escaping your net or not. And then they are restrained. So everyone has advantage to hit them. If they choose not to escape, they have disadvantage to hit someone else. Mm -hmm. And if they try to escape, they have to use their action to make a DC 10 athletics check to escape, which for some creatures is going to be not, you know, not a huge deal. But for a lot of creatures, you're still looking at a 50-50 shot of even being able to escape. Yeah. So you have to waste an action destroying it, which most creatures will be able to do because it only has five hit points. And because right. it's not a thrown weapon, you can't draw it for free. So the one good thing is that your character who chooses to come into the battle with a net ready in hand gets to do this trick once, unless they... Well, I guess they could be just drawing things as their free action. But so you, I was thinking you mm -hmm. could have the skirt of nets, and I guess that's still possible. I have a skirt of nets, and I pull a net. And I chuck it at you. Yeah, so you could do it every round and just constantly mm -hmm. restrain a thing as one of your attacks, which for a lot right. of characters would be worth it. Totally worth it. On um, you know, important monsters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's not my you, favorite. It, and if you have a high dexterity and you're the the thrower, that makes the that uh and it only it takes one. If you have multiple attacks, it only takes one attack. So as a rogue, if you get two attacks, you could still throw this, get your sneak attack, mm -hmm. and let everyone else do their thing as well. And they're not prone. So even those ranged combatants don't have disadvantage. Like that's the one thing prone does is it gives disadvantage to those ranged attackers. Not this. This is restrained. So everybody gets advantage. Okay. So, you know, things I like overall from this Weapon Master, I think it's fun concept to want to play with the excitement of a subsystem like this. It clearly energized people hearing about it. Um, so I think that there, there is, this is ground that's worth exploring. It can be really fun. 
but I'd want to see it played enough to know whether it's fun from the from the perspective of of the of the game, the DM, and as compared to the beauty of the simplicity of the 2014 Player's Handbook. Because I think one of the things that when you look at 2014, it often looks a little bit boring. And then when you played it, you realize that the boring part of it opened up a lot of creativity mm -hmm. and resulted in really neat things happening at the table. And especially as I ran for lots of new players um, and, and, and experienced players as well, the space that was now available from not having, you know, your quick into action or your uh, swift action or any of these things that we've had in various editions became headspace for role playing for fun ideas. And I think that's one of the real strengths of 5e. If we fill everything with off turn actions, bonus actions, extra riders to your thing, suddenly everyone's turn becomes huge, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'm right there with you. And so we will see where this trend continues or not mm -hmm. going forward. Uh, more news. D&D &D, Honor Among Thieves, the movie, is now available digitally on demand or for purchase through Paramount. Uh, it's also offered through some car cable carriers or streaming services that partner with Paramount. Last I checked, it was at over two hundred million, um, so it's made its own money plus another twenty five or so percent, and uh, so we'll we'll call that good. And now you can get it in the privacy of your own home. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've heard from the Diana Jones Award. They have announced the Emerging Designer Program winners. There are four rising designers that they have announced and given this award, including Anthony Joyce Rivera, Aaron Roberts, Kayla Dice, and Sen HHS. And if you go search for the Diana Jones Award, you can read more about each of these emerging and rising designers there. Yeah, great to see. Um, looks like four awesome people. Uh, really happy for them. I'm glad Diana Jones is doing this. It's a really nice, you know, very new program that they're doing. Great to see. Mm -hmm. Yep. From the good news of the Diana Jones Award to the sad news of Keith Baker Presents closing its doors. So Keith Baker, as probably you know, is the creator of the original Eberron setting. He's been working with Keith Baker Presents to publish Eberron flavored products. They're sold on the DMs Guild because the DMs Guild allows the Eberron setting to be written for. And they've they've had four very successful products, uh, two of them Adamantine and two Mithril bestsellers. They're uh, at number one and five on the most popular DM Guild banners. Uh, so that's <laughs> big news. But wait a However, minute. I'm, Clearly, they're yeah. hugely successful, Sean. How could they be closing their doors? How... how uh, well, on January 30th, the company said that they will be closing their doors. Another company called Visionary Production and Design will be overseeing the previous works and also publishing the final book called Frontiers of Eberron Quitstone. Keith Baker will be turning his focus on other works. So it's almost as if giving 50% of all your revenue is a problem, even for those folks that seem to be hugely successful on the platform. And maybe the inability to kickstart crowdfund mm -hmm. in any way is a deal breaker when you're trying to actually grow. And that's something that's very important. I hope that what you know comes out of this is uh, I hope this is a, a something that wizards will really listen to carefully when it comes to any other marketplace visions they have, like for D&D Beyond or the virtual tabletop, that when you close things off and make it so it's only on one platform, even your best names will have trouble making it really work. Yep. It's a tough industry and you know, closing things down definitely makes it tougher. But there are some Kickstarters coming, speaking of Kickstarters, either coming or already out there, there is the deck of player safety from Tom Nolan, which provides a simple set of cards that can be used by players at the start of a session to signal a topic to exclude from the gaming session. 
Yeah, and I, you want to take the I, next one? Oh, yeah, and I just want to say I like this concept. Um, it hasn't funded yet, so it could use your help. But it um, it's nice because it's at the beginning of the session before you start play rather than an X card that's during play. And it's done in an anonymous way from a deck of cards choosing topics that you want to, to avoid. And I thought that was a really neat concept. Uh, the next one is Limitless Champions, Disabled D&D 5e NPC Cards and Miniatures by Dale Critchley and Wormworks Publishing, bringing representation of disabled people through miniatures and NPC stat block cards. Some really cool minis in there uh, featuring all kinds of different uh, accessibility uh, uh, characters that have accessibility issues and making them look totally awesome in miniature and card form. So well worth it. Mm -hmm. We have Amazing Encounters and Quests from the Brazil-based Brazil CZRPG. This combines maps and fun encounters into a single product that you can use to delight and terrify your players. Empty Black's Emporium of Wonders, 400 of the most imaginative and useful magic items ever devised for 5e. Uh, Empty Black sometimes treats Sean and I with and, and other folks with uh, examples of these as he's been working on them. So we've seen a few of the really cool ideas. So as anything that MT Black does, it's awesome. Check it out, The Emporium of Wonders. Yep. And finally, this isn't an RPG game, but it's a board game, RPG game, sort of. It's Clank, Legacy 2, Acquisitions Incorporated, Darkest Magic. So you know more about Clank than I do. So give, give us the rundown. Yeah, Clank is a, there's a whole bunch of Clank games. And the basic concept is going to the dungeon, uh, trying to gain loot. Uh, but there's, you know, only so long you can go because a dragon will wake and breathe fire on you and possibly kill you. Uh, and that's a fun mechanic just on its own. But they made this legacy format for Acquisitions Incorporated, the first one. It's the best board game legacy experience my family has ever had. Board game experience, period. Like, just we had so much fun playing through that. I could not recommend it more strongly as a board game experience. If you can handle that legacy format where, you know, you're playing and every time you play, you get through the story. And I think it's something like 10 to 12 games, something like that, and then you're done with it. But it is so good. Well, well worth it. So now they're crowdfunding part two. I am, you know, immediately in. Can't wait to have it. And, uh, look forward to playing this so i hope it raises a ton so they add more and more to it because it was really just such a fun the writing of it the story the way the map changed all of it really great and that is our news for this week